Thank you for being with us tonight as we are continuing with our study of the book of Jude. Dr. David Watts is with us tonight, Gabriel, Josh, Mike Muzzerall, and uh, you, and we're so glad to have you. We, uh, to give you an overview of where we have been in the book of Jude, we established in week one, for those of you that were not with us, that Jude was the half-brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We brought out in verse 3 that he had set out and intended to write uh, a letter dealing with salvation, probably something along the lines of Paul's writings in the book of Romans. However, the Holy Spirit uh, moved strongly upon him to change uh, the direction of the letter and to deal with false doctrine and false prophets that had come into the church. And, uh, and that is established in verse 4. And then in verses uh, 5 and 6, 7, and he dealt with, he gave examples, the Holy Spirit through Jude gave examples of those who had rebelled against God's way in times past, uh, dealing with the angels who fell with Satan and those that came down to earth, Genesis chapter 6 who cohabitated with women. That's where the giants came forth that we read about. And then as well with the, uh, the, the problems of Sodom and Gomorrah, their rebellion against God as, and uh, as far as using their bodies in the way that God never intended it for it to be. And then verse 9, we dealt with the fact of that uh, uh, Satan and uh, Michael the archangel got in a little tussle over the body of Moses. And now, beginning with verse 10, we go back, Jude goes back to dealing more directly with these false teachers. Now, Jude does not tell us who these men were, and he doesn't tell us what they were teaching. Uh, they could have been Judaizers, it could have been the Gnostics, it could have been both, or it could have been uh, a third wave of era that had come into the church. And we don't know why the, that the Holy Spirit did not see fit to, for Jew to identify who these men were and what they were teaching. However, we brought out on the first Wednesday night of this series that if you, if you know the Word of God well enough, you don't really have to know who is who. You can tell what's wrong when it's being taught. That's right. It's more important to know the era than to know the person of the era at times. Now, there is a perfect time. I mean, there is a time that it is appropriate to deal with personality as it regards false teaching. But really, the church, you and I, we should know the Word of God well enough that we would not have to have personalities pointed out to us. We would know the Word of God well enough to know exactly what is right and what is wrong. So we are at verse 10, and Jude writing says, But these false teachers speak evil of those things which they know not. The adage here applies... Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. But what they know naturally as brute beast. Jude refers to these false teachers as being in the class of unreasoning animals. In those things they corrupt themselves. Could have been translated by these things are being brought to ruin. Father, we come before you in the name of your son Jesus. We ask for your help tonight as we partake of the word of God. Help us to be able to articulate and to explain the word that these, your people, whether in the sanctuary or by SBN, that when we're through, that they will have an understanding of exactly what the scripture is telling us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I forgot to mention, we're using as our foundational study the commentary on Jude. Actually, it's four books of the Bible in this one commentary, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Jude. You can go and find it at Shop JSM, and I would encourage you. It's not a very big commentary, and actually, all four of these books, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, are, are three, or four, excuse me, four of the most powerful books in the Word of God. You need, to, you need this commentary. In this 10th verse, as Jude is going back and dealing 
with these false teachers. It's kind of amusing, I'll put it this way, but when he starts it off, they speak evil of the things which they know not. He's, he is, that's a very nice way of saying they don't know what they're talking about. Right. It's a very nice way. I, 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 let me just quote what Dad said in the commentary. Uh, this is a, a very good apropos. Let me just read it. He said, the Holy Spirit through Jude characterizes these false teachers as being mentally deficient. And anyone that is teaching error is mentally and spiritually deficient. They're not being led by the Holy Spirit. So, and we know by the use of the pronoun these that he is speaking of false teachers. Uh, in, in, you know, even though we don't know what they were teaching, it had to be, by the terminology that is used, it had to be a teaching that was a direct attack or indirect attack on the person and or the work of Jesus Christ. So it had to be something that they were teaching that attacked the Lord. Now we know the, uh, the Gnostics, they attacked the deity of Jesus Christ. They didn't believe that he was deity. Uh, they, they, matter of fact, they put angels on a higher category than the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, it was definitely an attack against his person and against his work on Calvary's cross. Any comments? Yeah, I just want to, uh, two things. First of all, Paul refers to these as pseudo didascaloi, false teachers, and, and, and the big issue that Paul had with this was that they sounded like they knew what they were talking about, but as Jude also brings out, they knew nothing what they were talking about. They act, Gnosticism is a good example, you brought that out, where Gnosticism says, we have a knowledge you all don't have. And then when you listen to it, you realize they don't know what they're talking about. And to speak evil of here is blasphemio. And it literally, where we get the word blasphemy from. So they're blaspheming things they know nothing about, but they do know the base things. Later on, he'll, Jude will talk about that. And so when it comes to the natural things, they act as if they know. But when it comes to the spiritual things, they know nothing about it. In this, in this 10th verse, Jude puts these false teachers on the, the same level as animals. Now, I want you to think of this. That is the Lord's opinion of these false teachers. He brings them down to the level of animals, animals that don't know anything. And that is a horrible indictment. And I wonder today how many men and women who stand behind the pulpit would fall into that category. Mm -hmm. I cannot answer that question, and I won't attempt to answer that question, but I, I think the number would be higher than what we realize in the eyes. Hey, John Phillips, uh, he actually was a professor at Moody Bible Institute yeah. many years ago, and he made a statement, and actually I felt it was kind of appropriate, and you were kind of touching on it. He said, what characterizes the apostate is his colossal ignorance of spiritual things. Mm -hmm. He says he might be a seminary professor or a pastor of a big-name society church. He might have, after his name, degrees conferred by Ivy League co colleges in token of his scholarship. He might pontificate in the classroom and the pulpit about the Bible, Christian belief, and matters of eternal significance. But I like this line. But a godly chimney sweep who knows God knows more than he does about the things of the Spirit of God. Yes. And that puts it out right. I mean, that is a bold That's statement good. and truth. That, that describes so many that are pastoring or even in seminaries that uh, these men, like Brother Mike, Brother Gabe, like you guys have said, they pretended to be spiritual, right. but their knowledge was natural. You can study the Bible like you study literature, like you study history. You can know what it says. There's many seminarians who know what it says, but they haven't had an encounter 
with the living God. The Holy Spirit hasn't revealed these deeper things of Scripture. That's why when we talk about how to study the Bible, we use Bible study methods, but the most important thing that I stress, we stress at the college, is the role of the Holy Spirit in Absolutely. our Bible study because the Holy Spirit teaches us and speaks to us. So there are many, there are people who have PhDs in theology that are atheists right. because yes. they... Yeah. They, you know, they, they have a lot of learning. They know history. They know what the Bible says, but they haven't had a, a heart change. They don't know these deeper spiritual things because the Bible is not just inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it's also illuminated by the Holy Spirit. So when we read the text, he speaks to us through this word. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus then you're not going to, he's not going to speak to you. You're well, not going to know it. You, excellent. And you've got to have the help of the Holy right. Spirit. Right. You've got to. I know today I was studying uh, and looking up some information um, uh, for a message I'll be preaching soon. And the text was from the New Testament, but it was based on an Old Testament principle out of the book Leviticus. And I was looking at what writers had to say. And I knew what the type was in the Old Testament. I didn't have to look it up, but I wanted to see what other scholars. And I was shocked as I went through one after the other, one after the other, that not one single one of them came out with the proper scriptural analogous, analogy of the type and the shadow. Right. And what, what it represented in the Old Testament was what it truly represented in the New Testament. They talked all around it, but not, and I don't mean just one or two, but I went through scores of them. And not one of them, and you know why? Not a one of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm making a point here. You cannot properly interpret the Word of God without the help of the Holy Spirit. So you, need, so you as, as your own personal study... Every morning before you, you don't have to say it out loud. I do because I've gotten into the habit. But when I op before I even open up, whether it's a commentary or whether it's my, whatever it is that I'm studying, I say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm not smart enough to properly understand without the help of the Holy Spirit. Give me the help of the Holy Spirit to properly interpret what I'm reading. Because when you take something that is truth and you misapply it, you misinterpret it, it not only will fall out to a negative on your part, but it, you, can be, you can hurt someone by improper explanation. It can lead people down the wrong path. Like Brother Lawrence said, I'll never forget what he said in the camp meeting. You can get it half right and still have it all wrong. Mm -hmm. Verse 11. If I could say this, yes. when we look at the gospel, the more that you study it, the more that you will see the cross as the central theme from Genesis to Revelation. The cross, the plan of God, the wisdom of God expressed. And let's not miss something here. These individuals that would be described by some of these things, they, they are, they're ignorant regarding these things, but they're very wise. They use the wisdom of words. They're very wise in what they do regarding things not of God, but they take the Scripture and they use it for their own purposes. I, I'm not an old man, but I've worked for a few years at least in the business world. And I have seen men that, that are extremely intelligent, they're extremely learned, and they're very wealthy. They're good at what they do. And they take words, they take, and, and they allure people to them, and that helps them to do business. There are those in the church world that are doing the identical thing. Sure. They have made, and that's always been the case, but here's the point. The, the differentiating factor, what will keep us from missing, or what will keep us from falling into this lie, is to understand the finished work of Christ. And the examples that we're going to read in just a moment in the next verse, you can pinpoint in each one where that particular individual from Cain to, to um, Korah and um, the third one, Balaam, thank you, where they all missed the mark specifically regarding God's prescribed order, 
of, his, of what he would ordain, but particularly the sacrifice. That's why we can know everything about the word of God, but if we miss the cross, we have really missed everything, and we will go completely off track and off course, and we will fall prey. We will fall prey. I don't care how much you know the Bible, you will fall prey to the wiles of the enemy, to the deceptive darts that he shoots out, because if you are looking at anything other than Jesus Christ and him crucified and that alone, you're going to miss the truth of the gospel. If you get the cross wrong, you get the Bible wrong. Right. Exactly. We can't stress that enough. Now, let me say that again. If you get the cross wrong, you cannot properly interpret the word of God. That's right. right. And it, you will find yourself in a bad, bad place. Yeah, the cross is the oldest doctrine in Scripture, and it's in the mind of God from the very beginning. And like you said, it's amazing how many uh, scholars and commentators don't see the types and shadows in the Old Testament, and they don't see the, 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 the symbols and the shadows. You, brought, you, just, you made a statement, the first doctrine. You know, we, we preach, we all, I've said it many times, that uh, in creation, the home was God's first institution. But the reality is, before the world was ever formed, mm -hmm. the first act that God determined was going to take place was the cross. The creation, the incarnation, all of that played a role leading up for the express purpose of God atoning for the sins of man on Calvary's cross. And that must ever be in the forefront of everything we say, everything we do, and everything we believe. And no matter what book of the Bible you're reading, you must read it in light of the cross. Amen. Because that's what the Bible points to. Amen. You know, we teach at the Bible College the Christocentric theme of the Bible, that every book of the Bible speaks of Christ either prophetically, historically, or in typology. Mm -hmm. And in typology, we've got to understand, you can never separate the Christ of the cross from the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. For all of eternity, Christ will have the nail prints in his hands. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not God, obviously, but I would think that he would have the, 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 the right to decide what his new body would be. And he said, no. He told the religious leaders, you will see the Son of Man, talking about the hypostatic union of Christ, Son of Man, speaking of the humanity, Son of God, his divinity. He said, you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand. So for all of eternity, Jesus chose to have the nail prints there to remind us, you can never separate the Christ of the cross from the cross of Christ. Verse 11, woe unto them concerning apostasy and apostates. The Holy Spirit says to them, Woe, for they have gone in the way of Cain, a type of religious man who believes in God and religion, but after his own will, and who rejects redemption by blood. And ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward. The era of Balaam was that he was blind to the higher morality of the cross, through which God maintains and enforces the authority and awful sanctions of his law so that he can be just and the justifier of the believing sinner. He loved the wages of unrighteousness in coveting the gifts of Balak. And perished in the gainsaying of Korah. The gainsaying of this man was his rebellion against Aaron as God's appointed priest. This was, in principle, a denial of the high priesthood of Christ. Going back to the beginning, the Holy Spirit specifically told Jude in this 11th verse to begin with the word woe. Anytime you read the word woe in scripture, it's serious. You must pay attention. Go back to the book of Matthew and remember the words of Jesus. Woe to the scribes. Woe to the Pharisees. It is a pronouncement of judgment. He said, but these speak evil of those things in the verse, 10th verse, and then woe unto them. It's carrying on that thought. And then he says, for they have gone the way of Cain. Going back to Cain, Cain, he's describing these false teachers, presenting them in the light that Cain was presented, very religious. Cain was going to offer up a sacrifice. But it was not 
the sacrifice of God's choosing. It was a sacrifice of his own hands, his own labor. And so in essence, uh, the sin of Cain was he was saying, I don't need that bloody sacrifice. So he was repudiating the cross. So these false teachers, they don't come into the church with horns and a tail and a pitchfork. They come in using terminology that you are used to. They come in using phrases. They come in, I'll put it this way, externally clothed in the cloak of religion. They'll even come across as, as humble. They'll even come across as a servant, whatever the case. But it's all done for the express purpose to lead an individual further down the path of deception. You know, in Papal's book on sanctification that he wrote uh, just last year, I think it's one of the best books he's ever written. Yes, I agree. The book of sanctification. And in that second chapter, I believe the first or second chapter, he deals with Cain mm -hmm. and Abel. And there was a line that it was in that book. He said it any number of times. And I'm going to just paraphrase it. He, he said that the, 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 the sacrifice of Cain was beautiful to his eyes, but repulsive to God's eyes. And yet, when it came to Abel, that bloody sacrifice, it was beautiful in the, in the eyes of God, but repulsive to Cain. Mm -hmm. And it's the same situation today. When we talk about the cross, it is amazing to me how many preachers find that repulsive. Because we don't need it anymore, we got to go past it. But they, in, in essence, are following the way of Cain, very simply. They are developing a religion of their own and not going God's way. And it's very religious. It's very religious. It has all the terminology. It's very savvy. Very marketing. For, yep. it's, but it, is, it will lead the people away from God. For they have gone the way of Cain. Then he said, ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward. What was the sin of Balaam? Money. And when you get right down to it, all false teachers have as an end result a desire to separate the hearer from their money. Mm -hmm. That's really when it gets so down to it. Is the root of all evil. When it comes right down to it, you'll find money at the very core of the whole thing. It, it draws people. There, there's always a new fad. There's always something new, a new teaching. And, 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 but you know what? The Bible is not new. The same truth a hundred years ago is true today. The same truth of the Word of God a thousand years ago is true today. We don't need a new word. We don't need anything new. We've got that which works, and it's worked for centuries. And it's the Word of Almighty God. So it, the era of Balaam was reward, but also immorality. Because when he couldn't get uh, God to curse the people of Israel, then he got Balak to introduce false gods where sensual sexual practices were involved. And the women of these, that worship these false gods seduced the men of Israel. I'm, I'm going to say something, and some of you probably won't know what I'm talking about. But there has been in the last two or three years, a lot of them, you wouldn't know the names, and I'm not going to call the names, but many of these fringe streams in the Pentecostal charismatic world of teachings that's not right, well, their leaders have had problems. There's, there's been failure. And every one of them has been immorality and you can just think in your mind what it is and I, I'm, I maintain that if your foundation is false to begin with then you're setting yourself up for failure every single time so we not should not be surprised when we read of these men and their failures and perish in the gainsaying of Korah that's Numbers chapter 16 as we said 
The sin of Korah was that he rebelled against Aaron. And by rebelling against Aaron, who was the priest, as the note said, he was in effect rebelling against God, the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. So once again, we go all the way back to this. Cain, Balaam, Korah, and all of their rebellion, all of it centered in rebellion against Jesus Christ, who he was and what he came to do, die on the cross. Verse 12, these... Let me just say this. The sin of the world, you see it all the time in the world system. They desire to make God in their image. And sadly, the church desires to make a sacrifice in its own image as well, totally forsaking the cross. That is what has happened in all of these circumstances, especially when you look... Uh, in the circumstance of Korah, but the fact is we have to, again, be very careful because as much as we can talk about and point the finger to those in the church out there, it has to start with us. We must guard ourselves and be very careful that our faith is exclusively in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that finished work, and that we're not looking to other things. That is the first line of defense against all of this. Absolutely. Because these individuals, these brute beasts as they're referred to, they have followings and crowds. You know what would happen if they didn't have any? Their message wouldn't go anywhere. No. They wouldn't have any money. They wouldn't have, had, have anything propagating that. So the people that are giving to that are helping it to go forward. God help us that we never fall into that category. Well, go back to Balaam for a second. I didn't bring this out. I want to bring it out next. It just popped into my mind. False doctrine will always lead to destruction. 24,000 men of Israel lost their lives because they followed the era of Balaam. You, false doctrine, you will lose your soul. How harsh is the wrath of God on people that deliberately lead people into sin? I mean, Balaam deliberately led the camp of Israel into sin. And it's just a, it's such a sobering thought that whether it's Korah, Korah was, uh, you know, he was a Levite, but he wasn't of Aaron's family. He was wanting authority. He was wanting more than what he was allowed to have. And whether it's Korah, whether it's Balaam, you know, the, these or Cain getting out of this plan of God and, and craving this authority over others, whether it's money driven, it's very serious business, this spiritual, uh, just this deception. And like you said, 24,000 people died. The Lord brought the plague on because of their, uh, their disobedience. And he knowingly led, Balaam knowingly led them into sin. When God judges, he judges. Yeah. You know, Dad, we were, this morning, well before daylight, when I got in from walking, I, I was making my tea, and I was looking on my phone, and I, 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 I subscribed to the Christian Post. We talked about this at, at the, the staff meeting. And I, I, something popped up, and it caught my eye, and, and it left me totally perplexed at the condition of the modern Pentecostal church. The largest Pentecostal church in the state of Missouri, an Assembly of God church, just had a huge men's meeting. So big, they had to have it in a, an arena. Thousands of men. It started out with a tank coming in, crushing cars. I don't know what that has to do with the work of God. It's manly. And, yeah, sure. really. Yeah, that's what they say. But that, that was bizarre enough. But here was the, the, the big controversy. This is an Assembly of God pastor. The largest Pentecostal church in the state of Missouri. Not just of that denomination, but of any charismatic, independent, or affiliated. And they brought out to the people a sword swallower. His big thing was 
he had a stripper pole. And he would lick the pole, ripped his shirt off, and then was making gyrations on a stripper pole while he put a sword down his throat. I, 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 I just read, said, what? What have we come to? How far have we sunk? I have to question the salvation of everyone involved at putting that on. Mm -hmm. Or those who stayed. It was, it was, and then the next night somebody had enough courage to stand up publicly on that platform, one of the guest speakers, and rebuke it. But he in turn, well, but he in turn got rebuked and pulled off the stage. And, you know, and, and really the guy that was doing the rebuking has, he's got so many problems of his own. And, but still, I, I thought, well, at least somebody was trying to stand up yeah, amen. for righteousness. But the point I'm trying to make in all of this is where have we sunk to? What what are we doing? Where, I, I where had friends that were at that gathering, and I said, why can't we just have a time of worship and then someone get into the Word? If we're gathering as men to become better Christians or better fathers or husbands, why can't we just get into the Word? Why do we have to have Las Vegas-style entertainment before these events? And it's it's an embarrassing terrible stain it's been all over secular news christian oh, they're news. making the secular people are making fun of like what are y'all doing yeah, yeah it's 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 an absolute embarrassment and it's just there, there's there's no justification for it but we I, I mean we just there's no reason why we can, if we're not satisfied with getting in the word of god we've got huge problems well here, here's the point i want to make on this thousands of men sitting there okay Let's get down to the brass tacks of where these men are. Mm -hmm. There are men sitting in that congregation bound by pornography. Mm -hmm. There are men sitting in that congregation that was there that's fighting drugs. Nobody knows it. Fighting alcohol. Mm -hmm. Fighting a spirit of lust. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of, Of anger. The list goes on. They need somebody to stand up and preach. Yeah, that's it. And explain to them how to live for God. Instead of bringing, well, don't get me started. Well, Brother, Brother Donnie, Donnie, I feel like we've lost the sacredness of the pulpit. I feel like we've lost, we make light of the, the, like you said earlier, teaching the Word of God is serious business. We need to know the meaning of the text and leading people into the truth. And I feel like we've just, we've lost all the sacredness and the respect and reverence of the pulpit by when allowing you, when this you, kind of thing. When you leave the cross, yeah. That's what. It, that's it. That's what happens yeah. when you leave the cross. Your own stupidity enters the enters the arena. The closer you are to Christ and Him crucified, mm-hmm. the more you realize the holiness there we go. and the yeah. sacredness of who Christ is. Amen. You and know, that sacrifice, right, that He paid. That we might be redeemed from sin. That we might be snatched out of the burning embers of hell. And he did it all for us. And we're going to celebrate that by bringing a sword swallower. God help us. Ichabod. That's you know, right. years ago you made the comment, and I totally agree that I quoted you many times on this and will continue. Every sermon has a spirit behind it. It's either the Holy Spirit or else a demonic spirit behind it. When we're listening to a sermon, we should ask the question, is the Holy Spirit behind what is being brought forth? And that, that means that we have to have a relation, a personal relationship with God. And we have to have an understanding of God's Word to know whether the Holy Spirit is behind it or not. These men should not have come back the second day. 
They should have they should have themselves yeah. been strong enough. And if some of them, most of them were pastors, is that right? Or no, it was it was oh, just, just ordinary just general. Men but they should have had enough of an understanding of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would would not have been confirming this. He would have been convicting the people. But they can't have it if the church they go to is not teaching. Right. And, and right. that's the concern we're having is that in what we call Pentecostal churches, we're seeing a decrease in the move of the Holy Spirit in these churches. The number of people being baptized in the Holy Spirit has dropped now, I think, in some of these churches, less than 50%. If we're not letting the Holy Spirit have his way in the church, and what's the Holy Spirit going to point at? It's going to point at Calvary. And yeah. preaching still works. Absolutely. I, I, preaching still works. Now, here's the good news. Looking at our staff... The people do not have to worry about sword swallowing and stripper poles. We're good. All right? Amen. We're going to preach, and we're going to preach the cross here, and the people know that. Verse 12, these are spots, rocks, in your feast of charity when they feast with you. These false teachers participated in the Lord's Supper, thereby claiming to be godly. Feeding themselves without fear. Furthering their own schemes and lusts instead of tending the flock of God. Clouds they are without water. Such disappoints the ground that needs rain. Likewise, these false teachers look good outwardly, but inwardly there is no substance. Carried about of winds. They seek believers with itching ears. They have no true course of the word of God. Trees whose fruit withers without fruit. There is no proper fruit, simply because good fruit cannot come from a bad tree. Twice dead. They were dead in trespasses and sins before being saved. And now they've gone back on God and are dead again, i.e., twice dead. Plucked up by the roots. They are not like the true tree planted by the waters. Now the Holy Spirit, in verse 12, he calls these false teachers rocks. He doesn't even equate them with a human. He calls them rocks. But here's what you've got to do. Feeding themselves, their, their feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. This is speaking of fellowship. They participated in the feast, the, the, all of the people, but they did it for the express purpose of seducing the people. Presenting themselves in a spiritual atmosphere as a voice of the Lord, but yet the whole purpose was to pull people away to their false teaching. And then it, but here's the indictment. He said they're clouds without water. What he's saying is this, we, we have to have the rain. The body of Christ, we have to have the rain of the Spirit. We've got to have the Word of God preached. We've got to have truth given to us. Uh, we grow by our study of the Word and by what is preached from behind the pulpit. When it's anointed of God, the people are fed. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. But these, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You're going to get that here. But he's saying these men, they talk a good game. But they are clouds. There are no water in those clouds. They will not help you. They will harm you. And then he said, carried about of winds. They're looking around for, look, there's enough people out there looking for somebody to twiddle their, to uh, uh, tickle. tickle their ears and uh, whose fruit withers without fruit. There is no fruit from false teachers or fa false teachers do not produce fruit. And their followers cannot produce fruit because it's based on a lie. And then he said twice dead. And in essence here he's saying they were once saved, but they no longer know the Lord. How many preachers today would fall into that category? We've got to hurry here. One more. Let's get verse 13. Raging waves of the sea. Refers to the destruction caused by false doctrine. Foaming out their own shame. False doctrine is like the foam or scum at the seashore. Wandering stars. An unpredictable star which provides no guidance for navigation. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Refers to their eternal doom. Raging waves of the sea. You've seen when there's been a tropical storm. 
and you see all of the debris that gets washed up, he's saying that these false teachers, all they produce is debris. Shattered lives. Broken lives. Uh, foaming out of their own shame. You've seen the, when the waves hit it, the foam. He's, that's what the false die. It makes, a, it makes a lot of foam, but it produces no fruit. It, there's no life in it. And finally, wandering stars. It's like the star in the sky that just shoots. Every, it doesn't lead you anywhere. The gospel, the true gospel, will always lead you to Christ and Him crucified. This star, this star will lead you in the right path. And the last thing I want to say, we got to close here. And he said, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's eternal damnation. So we better wake up, church. As a minister of the gospel, and I close with this statement, it is an awesome Holy responsibility to open up this book that we call the Bible and try to use to di- use it to direct the affairs and the lives of the sheep that the Lord has given us. And God help us if we abuse the people. God help us if we teach wrong. And, and I, I can say this for all of these men on the platform. Anytime they stand up to teach or preach, they're going to teach you the truth. They're going to preach the truth. I guarantee that. Stand to your feet tonight. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the truth of God's word. Lord, we pray that what we brought forth is a help to the people. That we understand that we are to try the spirits. That we're not to believe every wind of doctrine. That everything that is taught or preached in our past must be backed up by the Word of God. Lord, give us a move of God in this church. Give us a move of God across this nation. We're facing perilous times. And God, the only thing that can save us is a move of God, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. And Lord, we're ready to receive and we give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn around and love somebody. We'll see you Sunday morning. Well, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me Jesus I'll never forget how you set me free Jesus I'll never forget how you brought me out Jesus I'll never forget We hope you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. 
Family Worship Center located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call 1-800-288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.